All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Derek, and uh, uh, most importantly, Venerable Chanda for inviting me uh, to share some uh, Dhamma here for Anukampa Buikuni project that now finally has a um, brick and mortar home in the UK. Very exciting news. Um, so welcome to everyone. And uh, maybe we can start our time uh, by doing some meditation practice. And um, if you're not in a seated position already, you can uh, find a comfortable position right now. And maybe we can rock our body from side to side. And when we're ready, we can close our eyes and take a few deep breaths. You can relax our entire body. from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. And then we can take a few moments just to acknowledge the mood that we're currently experiencing right now. What does it feel like? Are we perhaps tired? Are we anxious? Are we happy, elated, distressed, grieving? How does that feel like in the body? And as we take the time to acknowledge our emotional experience, we can take more time to really analyze with detail, with curiosity, our physical experience of the emotion. Dropping any story, any memory that we have of why we're experiencing what we're experiencing. It doesn't matter who said what, doesn't matter what we did. It doesn't matter what we tasted, what we heard, what we smelled, what we saw. All of that doesn't matter. What matters is what we're experiencing right now in the body. What does it feel like? Looking at the physical sensation with much curiosity. As if we were trying to figure out a puzzle or if we were a scientist looking at some data.
What does this physical sensation feel like? Where does it manifest? Perhaps it's a tingling sensation in the stomach. Maybe it's some tension on our shoulders. Maybe it appears in one place and disappears in another. Maybe it feels permanent. long lasting. Or maybe it feels like something we can't quite grasp. Doesn't matter what it's like, what matters is that we're aware of it. looking at it with mindfulness and clear comprehension. If thoughts appear in the mind in relation to the emotions that we're experiencing, we can just let them go. Not right now, they're not important. And we can just go back to that physical experience of our emotion. To how it's tracked inside of the body. Without any mental narrative. A physical experience no different than the breath. We observe it no different 
than any other meditation object that we might choose. Perhaps we're confused by these meditation instructions or maybe just observing our emotions creates some sort of anxiety. In all of these cases, then we focus our mind to what does it feel like to be confused inside of the body? What are the physical sensations that we feel? we experience when we are confused? Or what does anxiety feel like in the body? And that's our meditation object. observing those physical sensations in every single moment without any judgment, but just learning from them.
And the more we observe our emotional experience in the body, the more we see how it's constantly changing out of its own accord. Sometimes these physical sensations appear and then they disappear. They manifest in one part of the body and disappear and manifest in another part of the body. Whether we like it or not, whether we want them to stay or not, they appear and disappear out of their own accord. They're constantly changing. So how can these emotions define us? How can they be who we are? If they were who we were, if we owned them, We could decide for them to disappear right here, right now, or appear right here, right now. But it's just dukkha that arises and dukkha that ceases. doesn't belong to us. It's just like this. We don't have to pick it up, make it ours, cling to it. We can just let it go. Not be bothered by it. And instead, create the conditions right here, right now for other consequences in the future. we can never control the consequences but we can always control the causes and so we can take the time to wish for ourselves to always be happy always be peaceful Always be kind, content, generous. And creating the conditions in our heart for metta, loving kindness to be generated. to fill up our entire mind, our entire experience. We can shower ourselves with these love, being kindness thoughts.
May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. And we can extend this wish to all the people meditating in the room with us, to all the sentient beings sharing our space, whether human and non-human, and also all our friends that are practicing together tonight. May we be happy, may we be healthy, may we be safe. May we be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May we be happy healthy and safe. We keep growing and growing and growing. This loving kindness in our heart and mind. Extending it in every single direction north, south, east, west, why would we ever want for anyone to be anything other than happy for their benefit and the benefit of others? May all ascension beings be happy. May all sentient beings be safe. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings have happy minds. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, and delusion and attain unconditional happiness. May all beings attain supreme, blissful Nibbana.
for their benefit and the benefit of others. May all beings be happy. And we can treasure this loving kindness in our heart, keep it there growing warm. And without letting it go, we can slowly come out of meditation practice and open our eyes. And we can say three sadhus with our hands in Anjani. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. All right, and at this point you can stretch out your legs a little bit if you need to. All right, so at this point, we can um, start by paying homage to our original teacher, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're all gathered here today. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Bhutam tam ham sangham namasami. So last time we spoke a little bit about uh, the Tirigata um, translation that uh, I did last year, and um, I shared a few reflections on um, on the process of the translation and all the different um, kind of like an overview of um, of the different narratives that we find um, within. Uh, from the words of the of our elder bhikkhunis from the past. Mm. And today I was thinking about actually focusing a little bit on love, since we uh, also just did some metta meditation. Um, and it was preceded by actually an invitation to do some mindfulness of emotions, so an awareness of our emotions. And love is something, you know, that um well we talk a lot about in buddhism and we also don't talk much about <laughs> we talk a lot about metta um unconditional love uh but also sometimes it's it's difficult especially if we're monastics to to really can get in the nuts and bolts of um of love what it what love is and i remember when i was a lay person definitely i was a uh, very romantic um romantic uh, person and um, uh, I remember prior to Buddhism you know my mind was very much um, very ambitious and very much um, all about unconditional love and um, when I got to practice I was like yeah you know I'm still still was kind of you know pretty attached to this idea of unconditional love and I was so sure that I was uh, in all my relationships I had kind of um, you know sort of mastered this unconditional love but then it kind of as I was practicing it kind of dawned on me that actually <laughs> my idea of unconditional love was pretty much everything but unconditional it was very conditional <laughs> and as my you know relationships you know ended um I would have 
more and more conditions uh, for the, you know, the, the ones that were going to happen afterwards. So I remember going like, yeah, you know, I want a person that, you know, has this uh, kind of personality trait, but not that personality trait, has this job, but not that other job, or is ambitious, but not egocentric, um, like creative and artistic, but employed, you know, all of these things, <laughs> all of these conditions. And I had actually, I think, accumulated quite a long list throughout the years. Um, and I was still kind of attaching this idea of unconditional um, love to it. And this idea of, um, you know, <laughs> of course, all of these relationships are ending because there is not the right person right there, right? But I'm sure that at a certain point, uh, the conditions will be there where we'll have uh, kind of, and they lived happily ever, um, ever after sort of scenario. <laughs> But actually, even there, you know, kind of the, the experience was very much a little bit different than than the aspiration. So uh, we can see it for anyone who's um, who's had more than one relationship or even one relationship. We can see it within one relationship, too. Uh, we can see that a lot of the things um, um, are of the nature of to change um, in the in the relationship. So we think that, you know, perhaps the person um, that we uh, start a relationship with where it's kind of mm, maybe a good match right when we meet them but then all of a sudden the, the the common interests that we share start disappearing maybe they take on some interests that we're not interested in or vice versa maybe we change we get into meditation practice maybe we can become buddhists and they're like well what is this weird thing that you do you know you go on retreats you disappear <laughs> you don't eat <laughs> you're silent you don't pick up the phone uh, quite awkward right so we start mm, taking uh different parts or like maybe we uh sorry different roads or maybe you know we we find someone else that is more interesting than the other person before so uh, we fall in love with someone else or maybe you know what initially we were finding charming of that person of that significant other then actually it starts becoming really irritating <laughs> it's the trait that we can't stand um, the most, even though it was the trait that we liked the most. Um, so all in all, you know, the, um, the relationship is not really like what we have imagined it to be. And it's very interesting, you know, how the Buddha mm, tells us that essentially our experience as unenlightened beings is marked by vipalaza. So this distortion of views, distortion um, of reality. Um, distortion essentially of perception actually um, and so essentially he tells us that uh, we um, you know what is an each what is impermanent we take as permanent and what is dukkha so what is suffering we take as instead as uh, pleasant as happiness and what is impersonal um, we anatta we take as personal and then also what is asuba what is non-beautiful we take as beautiful and so we see uh, when we, you know, there's actually a beautiful song when in, in Italy that um, used to be one of my favorite songs. I remember I would uh, used to listen to it um, from time to time. Uh, it's actually a song from the 60s uh, that I think really captures, it's not a Buddhist song, but says this really Buddhist thing that I remember thinking was really, really real. Um, and it's, it goes uh, basically, mi ritorni in mente, bella come sei, come non sei tu. It's, uh, it's uh, translated, it, it, it's, um, uh, you come back into my mind, beautiful like you are, like you are not. <laughs> and it's this uh, kind of constant distortion, you know, uh, where especially if maybe we can also experience that if we've had um, long distance relationships, maybe, you know, or maybe we've met some person one time and then we see them after a couple of days and we're kind of like, huh, wait, that's not exactly, don't look exactly like I remembered, uh, both physically and per personality wise, right? That's because we kind of fabricate um, most of the time, a lot, a lot of stories in our mind, both when it comes to the body and when it comes to um, the traits that this person is manifesting. So very rarely we're actually there fully understanding who we have in front of ourselves and even who we have 
who we spend most time with, which is ourselves. <laughs> so we have a very little understanding of ourselves and others. And um, today I wanted to kind of uh, see what, um, you know, kind of explore these these sort of themes uh, within the Terigata, so within the experiences of uh, of the different theories uh, who are all fully enlightened. And, um, um, you know, when it comes to physical appearance, uh, for example, there is different episodes in the Terigata that uh, where either, for example, Mara uh, comes up to Upalavana and starts, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to <laughs> uh, both kind of interest her in sensual pleasures, interest her in um, in kind of, he's pretty much actually cat calling her <laughs> in a way or the other, we can use that modern term. Um, and the same actually happens to see Suba of uh, Jivaka's Mango Grove, where she's stopped by this grove, uh, by this rogue in, um, in a forest grove. Um, and uh, he also is very much enchanted by her physical beauty and by her youth and um, is very, very vocal um, about his interest towards her. And so both Mara and both the rogue, and probably the rogue is a manifestation of Mara anyway, <laughs> uh, but they're both dealing with um, enlightened, um, enlightened women here. So both of them have this um, sort of um, communication where, where they're not quite understanding that the the person in front of them is fully enlightened and they're trying to dissuade them from from living the holy life um but you know there's very different means through which for example the rogue um tries that out with Subine. so um maybe he at a certain point he does uh, he makes all these references uh, about the beautiful forest um, that is such a romantic setting. Um, or she, he starts infantilizing her by calling her, oh, young and innocent girl. <laughs> um, and uh, he's like, what are you uh, going to do here all by yourself in this in this forest? And I'm paraphrasing here. I don't remember exact ex the exact words. Um, but basically, es essentially, he's trying to instill fear in her. Um, and also that need perhaps for protection. Um, and just as I was saying before earlier, how uh, Marata is kind of a similar technique with Upalavana as well. And he describes also her with all sorts of nice um, appellatives um, based on her physical body and also describes possible pleasant scenarios that if she disrobes and uh, kind of elopes with him, that could happen as a lay person. <laughs> it's all nice, uh, nice fabrics that she could enjoy, nice dwellings, nice this, nice that. Um, but in particular, he's very much obsessed with uh, her physical appearance and in particular with her eyes. Um, so uh, he... <laughs> um, as he keeps on, you know, mm, praising her at a certain point, she's fully awakened. So uh, I have a quote here from her that I would like to, um, to quote from her. She says, well, what do you consider of value here in this carcass full of corpses bound for the cemetery, destined to break apart? What have you seen that makes you so deranged? So this is perhaps not the most famous quote of uh, Suba Jiro of Mako Grove, but I really love it <laughs> because I find it's very much connected to how we can also get deranged, um, you know, in as I was saying earlier, quoting that Italian song, you know, we can get very deranged <laughs> whenever we take up, you know, a physical element or a personality element and start building it up in our mind. Um, and so what is it really that we find that we consider a value here? as she's asking to, um, to the rogue, as Suba is asking to the rogue. Um, here in particular, she says, and there's carcass full of corpses, because actually when we um, think about it, you know, our, uh, our body uh, that we can get very fascinated with from the outside, actually 
especially for people who are not vegetarians, but even vegetarian people, actually, our body is full of corpses. If we're not vegetarian, we definitely eat constantly <laughs> a lot of carcasses. Um, so it's it's all full up. But even if we're vegetarian, actually, there is lots of different, uh, we're a host of lots of different worms and all sorts of different sentient beings that both procreate and die uh, within, <laughs> within our, our beautiful, pretty body. And so it's, this is true for ourselves and it's also true for others. Um, and also when it comes to all these beautiful physical parts, we see obviously in, um, in the part of the, this poem that is probably the most famous is when actually um, Suba takes her eye and it's like, oh, do you really think that this eye is so beautiful? And she like literally um, eradicates it. <laughs> <laughs> from her face and hands it on to the rogue and when he sees this rogue this eye essentially deprived from the other conditions of the other sort of pleasant parts of the body but only sees this bulb um kind of bloody <laughs> bloody bulb there which is the eye that he found so so beautiful in that moment actually he had a lesson of dhamma he understands and he um, he also leaves her alone and pays respects right but it's very interesting how when we see these single parts of the body they're actually quite gross in and of itself but when they are together then or they are in a certain context, then we find them appealing. So there's a lot of actually, um, you know, um, teachings of, of Asuba uh, within the Terigata, uh, both uh, in terms of actually instructions of the Buddha uh, to a lot of the Teris, and also teachings of the Teris, like um, as uh, the teaching that Suba gives to the rogue and to us as well in terms of inviting us uh, to reflect actually on how we um, how this what is it really that that we consider beautiful and how does this process appear in the mind and how this process um, also is dependently arisen essentially right so that is essentially a teaching of dependent origination of how um, once again, also the body, uh, also the, the eye is pretty when it's in these conditions. And when those conditions are in present, then it's not pretty anymore, <laughs> right? And the same goes with anything, with our hands, with our feet, with our every, any single part of the body. Um, so what we find attractive is dependently arisen. And when those conditions stop being there stop manifesting then that result of attractiveness stops being there and of course um <laughs> she's fully awakened so she has um i have another quote actually from her that i find extremely beautiful uh where she says um her essentially experience of the world as an enlightened being and she says there is nothing in this world even with all its devas which i could now have craving for i do not know what it could be like since it has been completely uprooted by the path it's so incredible i love how she says that essentially there is nothing that she has craving for so he basically, after he lists all the different beautiful things in samsara, including himself <laughs> and all the different scenarios, so she's like, well, you know, this is kind of completely useless. There is really nothing here that you're trying to play a game that, <laughs> that there is no conditions for, for you to play this game, essentially. Uh, everything has been uprooted in my mind. There is no craving. And I love how she says, I have no idea what craving would be like, like how I feel it. You know, the, the meditation that we did earlier, you know, we're experiencing the emotions. We always experience them first and foremost with the body. There is that physical sensation that really builds up our experience and that usually we act upon that physical sensation. It all happens very, very fast, very quickly. Um, and it's all marked by craving. 
And it's incredible how Soba has none of that. <laughs> she has no idea what craving is, not in the sense that she doesn't understand craving, but she doesn't have craving. So she's like, oh, I have no idea what it is. It's being completely uprooted <laughs> by the path. It's not present there. So there is no need to keep on playing this game. And um, once again, all of these teachings are teachings to make us understand the practice of Asubha meditation, looking at the, um, the non-beautiful, the non-glittery side of the body are all uh, important ways through which we pierce this delusion. So, you know, the kind of greed and hatred, usually we have a bit of an awareness of how much greed and hatred we have, but delusion is very, very difficult. We can only see it in hindsight. Um, I definitely have still a lot of delusion to dispel, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, but I've also dispelled a lot of delusion um, throughout, the, throughout the years. And this is actually what is very interesting to me when right now I have no idea exactly what kind of delusion uh, there is still present in my mind. But um, I know how powerful this path is, the Noble Eightfold Path, the teachings of the Buddha are, because I can see how much delusion I have dispelled um, throughout the years just by practicing the teachings of the Buddha. So there is a memory if we look each one of us at when we first start really practicing the Dhamma of how erroneous our view of things are and how much we were creating suffering thinking that we were pursuing instead happiness, right? And that's basically how we're, um, as we change, as we shift um, um, our habits, as we shift, basically, as we start uh, practicing in accordance with Dhamma rather than in accordance with Moha, <laughs> then we become happier and happier. But we can also see how we have dispelled, how our mind has changed, how it has shifted, and how we also relate differently to sensual pleasures, hopefully anyway, or how we are um, understanding the importance of letting go, how we're understanding more the importance also of um, giving, of generosity, and how it the first people that uh, are benefiting are ourselves, right? But we also see the danger of sensual pleasures. We see the danger of uh, engaging in, in certain sensual pleasures that maybe we, we might have come to the path. At least I remember when I, when I had entered the path, um, being Italian, we have very some uh, cliche <laughs> of being pretty attached to food, right? So like food was a big, big um, thing um, within my my daily experience and was very difficult to be even on the eight precepts. You know, my the joke that I always make is that in the United States, people are always like shocked when they realize that monastics are celibate. They're always like, oh my God, how can you be celibate? That's like, whoa, really insane. And in Italy, everybody's like, oh my God, how can you not eat dinner? That it's insane. <laughs> totally okay with the celibacy. Like they're like, all right, whatever. <laughs> but what is really shocking is the dinner. Um, and so, yeah, there's each one of us, you know, has a bit of a um, kind of a tendency towards one particular or multiple um, particular essential pleasures that we rely on that we essentially take refuge in whenever we are experiencing suffering <laughs> we experience suffering and then we take refuge I used to take refuge definitely in the fridge I used to take refuge in the pantry <laughs> I used to take refuge in pasta and pizza <laughs> there was a time in my life actually uh, up until Buddhism really uh, where literally I could not live for longer than a month in a place where there was not Neapolitan pizza available. Uh, it was like my rule, even in London, I, I picked, I found the neighborhood where there was an, a Neapolitan immigrant who had a pizza <laughs> place. And I, I was like, okay, now I can live in London. Um, but it was like a really mental thing, uh, something that was very, very much true to me. Like literally my experience was that if there was not Neapolitan pizza in my life for longer than two weeks, I would become extremely depressed <laughs> and suicidal. Um, really silly, but but very real. I still remember that. And now actually, well, I live in West Orange, New Jersey, <laughs> uh, where is there is definitely, um, well, there's pizza, but definitely nothing even close to uh, 
<laughs> Italian pizza, right? And I'm actually so much happier than I used to be when uh, <laughs> Neapolitan pizza was uh, was readily available. Um, actually, in Italy, I was in Italy for a month and a half, and um, I didn't even have pasta. Not true. I had pasta twice in a month and a half. Crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> because nobody has pasta in Italy before noon. So <laughs> it's kind of like mission impossible, right? It had been tragic for me uh, prior to Buddhist practice to even think about it. I would have suffered just at the thought of it. But anyway, so it's very important to see how we can um, really relate to sensual pleasures as uh, a source of happiness, but not because the Buddha, you know, tells us so, or because we read it in the suttas, etc. But really by analyzing our experience of reality, looking at where we are, um, you know, kind of hung up towards, and also seeing how we are relating to it, and how unskillful our mind uh, becomes towards central pleasures. And when we make progress and we overcome, um, you know, our attachment towards some particular things, just like Neapolitan pizza, that might sound ridiculous, but once again, it was uh, something pretty, uh, pretty real with me, then we can see, oh, actually, wow, there was a lot of danger in pursuing that, uh, the danger of sensual pleasures. And we can see, uh, getting back to the Terigata, actually, Upalavanna uh, gives us uh, a really interesting, really extreme, actually, um, example of that, um, of the dangers of um, pursuing sensual pleasures. So she, and her realization of that. So she talks about in her poem of, um, well, it starts like this, I shouldn't have it here. Yeah, and she talks about, uh, we were mother and daughter, but we also shared the same husband. This terrifying and horrible situation gave me a sense of urgency. And she says, damn impure sensual pleasures, foul smelling and painful, where mother and daughter share the same husband. After seeing the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, I saw the safety of renunciation. I went forth in Rajaga from the home life into homelessness. And so we see how um, sometimes we can very much pursue certain I ideals um, and then they manifest in something quite different um, than what we want. You know, a lot of people, whether it's, you know, um, a heterosexual relationship or a homo homosexual relationship or a transgender relationship, whatever it is, um, it doesn't matter. Um, but we can idealize relationships so much, but then it can actually lead to so many different complications. And we see here for her, her experience uh, back then in ancient India, um, it was quite uh, polyamory was uh, very much prevalent and um, not necessarily consensual. <laughs> um, and actually still to this day uh, in many places of the world, it, um, that can be the case. And even actually in the West, um, there is um, maybe not legally, uh, in some places it's illegal, um, but in definitely um, that's the, the reality for many people. And for some people, it's actually completely fine. They're in polyamorous um, relationships where everyone um, is consenting to it. And that is completely okay. And in accordance with the precepts, by the way, <laughs> there's nothing against um, um, having multiple partners um, within the um, uh within the, the correct uh, sexual conduct in Buddhism. Um, but when, as with everything, when consent is not part of the picture, then that's when it becomes sexual misconduct. That's when it becomes problematic because it can hurt people. And definitely can also um, create these really sort of horrible situations as she's describing where um, she's a co-wife. So she's sharing uh, the same husband, but she's not just sharing it with uh, someone that, is a stranger, but actually her mother. And this creates this realization that this would have never been her experience had it not been for the pursuit of sensual pleasures, perhaps the the husband. And here, of course, where we can just run on assumptions because she doesn't really clarify exactly what in her poem anyway, um, of what exactly was going on in, the, in that relationship. Um, but we can see once again in ourselves, um, what is it that uh, can lead us to do 
to essentially arrive at sexual misconduct or do things that can harm others and also harm ourselves, of course. And it's always that basically um, in uncontrolled <laughs> pursuit of sexual pleasures. That's why we have that precept uh, also of, um, sorry, also we have that practice of in, in Buddhist countries of uh, during the Upasata, uh, usually um, the Buddhist people will then actually practice celibacy for a period of time, even though they're not monastics. And it's not because there's anything wrong in sexuality per se, but rather because we want to learn how to control uh, our sexuality rather than being controlled by it. Understanding that actually sexuality is a really strong um, desire, is a really strong pulse, which can easily dominate us rather than the other way around. And that doesn't mean that we have to be all monastics, obviously. Um, although I have to say that nice Yelp review, there are zero complications. Celibacy has <laughs> zero side effects. <laughs> but, you know, we don't have to necessarily um, go from zero to 100%, although I highly recommend it. <laughs> but at least to start learning how to contain ourselves. It's the same thing with uh, the precept of not eating afternoon for lay people as well. Um, it's not that, you know, it's a mortal sin to eat dinner, but rather um, what happens when we're constantly taking refuge in the fridge, as we were saying earlier, how uh, we're taking refuge in the pantry and not taking instead refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha and the three jewels and what is actually really important and leads towards the cessation of suffering. So we want to uh, experience that joy of missing out, of uh, seeing how there is um, a different way out than instead of constantly, whenever we're experiencing dukkha, to always go back to having some sensory input. And so that's why she's saying, I saw the safety of renunciation. I saw the safety of letting go. Because this is basically, whenever we let go, we practice letting go, um, we are creating a sense of safety for ourselves and others. That's why actually monasteries, um, even the animals, you know, feel very, very safe because we let go of everything. Um, then we let go of non-harm, we let go of harming, sorry, <laughs> let go of harming sentient beings. Also, that's a way of letting go. Every single precept is a way through which we let go of something. And that creates safety for ourselves and others. We let go of stealing. We let go of lying. We let go of all of that. And the more we let go, the more we're happy, the more we um, create this aura of safety. And then of course, in the case of Upalavanna, she wanted to let go of everything by having that profound realization through that, um, um, through that experience of suffering with her mother um, in that marriage that was definitely very difficult for her. Um, and so I wanted also to talking about how we can very much get eluded, especially with also all the different, you know, uh, expectations in society um, of getting a family, procreating, uh, whatever it is. Um, there's lots of different um, well, Disney movies, I think we're all raised with Disney movies and there's always the happy live, <laughs> they happily lived ever after. There's always like this kind of marriage and this kind of like idea <laughs> that we have set up. And uh, I wanted to talk about the experience of Muta that I have her part of her poem here where she, in her declaration of awakening, she says, I am well released and fully free, freed from the th three deceits of the mortar, the pestle, and the deceitful husband. I am free from birth and death. I have uprooted that which leads to any state of existence. So the three deceits here, she talks about it, uh, the mortar, the pestle, and the deceitful husband. <laughs> um, and uh, so of course, there are many references to domestic life. There are many references to, um, you know, the, like all sorts of ideas that we can have of, um, of the family life. But what I find really interesting, I think, is um, is really, once again, um, understanding the, the unsubstantiality of actually <laughs> of the, the Disney movie sort of um, 
kind of upselling <laughs> rather like okay I'm actually fully free of that I'm fully free of that kind of romantic ideal that that is going to make me happy I can throw it away and not having have it to convince myself and of course then she is free from birth and death because she's fully awakened so she doesn't have to come back again and um has uprooted anything that leads to any state of existence so now you're probably going to go okay this um this bikuni is all about <laughs> um she's very against relationships but no i actually want to uh, give you a nice uh, they live happily ever after love story that is actually present in the in in the terigata which is of course the story of um that we spoke about a little bit last time as well of Bada Kapilani and Mahakasapa that is in fact actually a great story of a relationship <laughs> where um um in in the poem of course uh, as we read it last time um she describes all the wonderful qualities of awakening of Mahakasapa, and then she describes in the same way, Bada Kapilani is also like equally awesome, uh, and her awakening manifests in the same in the same way. And um, I have here the end of her poem where she says, having seen the danger in the world, we both went forth. We have exhausted and tamed all the influences. We have become cool and quenched. And they live happily ever after is what I would... <laughs> <laughs> I would add here because once again yeah they um literally there it's the um, the culmination of the path is the re relinquishment of all suffering is the really uh, such a beautiful story where they both um come to the understanding instead of having all these expectations um that are not fulfilled and not met with one another uh, they just throw it all behind um, but at the same time, staying together, actually, staying together with uh, what is really the, the love that we talk about in Buddhism, which, not, which is not the love with attachments. It's not the love that we were talking about earlier. I will only love you if this X, Y, and Z thing comes into being. But there is the love of the unconditional love um, for one person, but for all sentient beings as well. And that is, you know, the metta that we aspire to. Uh, it's very interesting because, you know, obviously in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which I am sure you're all familiar familiar with, um, the way that the Buddha talks about how to essentially um, cultivate metta, he, um, he talks about it in terms of uh, just as a mother who would protect uh, her only child, essentially with her life. Uh, then one would cultivate this um, uh, boundless love towards all beings. But sometimes um, it's my impression that, you know, a lot of times we can equate this love, this motherly love with actually a love that has a lot of attachments, because at least, I don't know, maybe Italian mothers, <laughs> uh, having an Italian mother, <laughs> I have a bit of a um, definitely very loving mother very loving mother for sure but with a lot of attachment a lot of conditions a lot of anxiety a lot of um it should be like this right and that's not quite uh what we're talking about when it's coming uh to unconditional love there is though um a story that here a poem that i will end this um um, this sharing that I'm sharing today, which is the, the verses of the elder Bada's mother uh, here in the Tirigata, um, that is instead uh, an example of like beautiful, beautiful love from um, a mother for her child. So the mother and the child, she's a bikuni and um, he's a bhikkhu actually. And uh, she, uh, this is the way that an enlightened love uh, manifests. So she gives his uh, instruction to him. She's fully awakened. He is not. So she says, Vada, do not get caught in the endless thicket of the world. Oh, little child, do not take part in suffering again and again. Vada, the sages dwell easily, carefree and free from doubt. They have become cool and tamed and abide free from influences that path walked by the seers who have attained vision 
leading to the end of suffering. Vada, devote yourself to that. And Vada replies, Mother, you speak from a place of self-confidence. I suspect, Mom, there is no thicket to be found in you. And she replies, Vada, not even the slightest thicket based on any conditions, whether inferior, superior, or in the middle, can be found in me. I have destroyed all influences by meditating with heedfulness. I obtained the three knowledges and completed the teachings of the Buddha. And he replies, my mother spurred me with a noble goad with these compassionate verses of the highest benefit. After I heard her words instructed by my mother, I was met with a sense of urgency to practice the Dhamma for the attainment of safety from bondage. With a mind bent upon striving, active by day and by night, being exhorted by my mother, I touched the highest peace. So I just love how, um, yeah, it's such a beautiful manifestation of the real love, um, not real, the quintessential enlightened love <laughs> of a mother for her own child, where she actually establishes him, no different than the Buddha, how he does the same thing with Rahula, establishes him in, um, in the Dhamma, and then creates the conditions for the child to be completely free from suffering. And she does that by giving him um, clear instructions on how to let go, on how to relinquish. So she doesn't even say, okay, well, how about, <laughs> um, you know, you get uh, a family, you do this, you do that to get a work, get a job, become a lawyer, become a doctor, become this, become that. <laughs> As my dear parents have, um, you know, were instructing me, you should be doing this, <laughs> you should be doing that. And then when I was like, oh, actually, I'm going to become a monastic. They were like, like, absolutely, that's the most horrible idea that you've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> or you should have children wait you don't want to have children that's horrible why are you doing that to me etc and personalizing that and that's when basically love there's of course love my both of my parents I would say love me dearly but it's a love full of attachments and so instead actually what we want um, to cultivate is keeping the love and throwing the attachment out and understanding that um yeah, there's a way to do that. That's there's a way to support um, a sentient being um, so that they can actually be rooted in Dhamma. You know, a lot of um, a lot of people uh, sometimes um, who are new to the path uh, come and say, "Hey, well, like that." I sorry, that are new to the path that they converted to the path. They weren't born Buddhist. Uh, sometimes they come and they say, "Yeah, well, my children, I don't really bring them to the temple because I want them to decide whether or not uh, they want to practice Buddhism or if they want to do uh, their own different religion, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And uh, at the very beginning, you know, I was like, "Oh, that's very interesting," but now I think it's complete utter craziness. <laughs> it's kind of like if you have, um, if you find the cure for cancer and then you're like oh well I'm not and your child has cancer and you're like well you know actually um I don't want to give them the cure of cancer because I just want them to decide in the future whether or not <laughs> they will find um uh if they want this other cure or another cure it's completely like utter craziness but that also comes with the sense that we have created a being, that that being, you know, is um, is something that has been generated uh, from us, that is an extension of us, that is a limb of us, um, which is actually a re an erroneous view. It's maybe that perhaps that child that has, uh, you know, uh, that child's karma that has chosen the conditions to to be born um, with us. And our duty is just to create the, the best, to offer the best conditions in order for that being to be free from suffering. So if we have a really precious gift, we should be first and foremost sharing it for them. And then understanding that if they don't want to practice the Dhamma, then that is their choice, but not depriving them from something so, so, so uh, beautiful, so, so sweet. Um, so anyway, uh, this is a few, few considerations today. Uh, so we don't really prepare our talks in the <laughs> tradition. So I had a few, few quotes here. And sometimes this comes, um, has the result of having 
kind of a charming talk and sometimes a little bit <laughs> less charming. <laughs> so I think today it was a bit of all over the place, but then maybe at this time we can, you're welcome to ask questions or make comments and uh, maybe you can clarify what needs to be clarified, but we can end with uh, three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hi, James. You're the first today. Hello. Thank you for the talk. That was a lot of information. <laughs> um, it's always hard coming up with questions sort of straight after a talk, because often I'm sat here kind of digesting it, and, and it's only later that these things occur to me. But um, just something that struck me right on the end there, um, I don't know whether it really relates to the rest of it, but something I'm curious about is that you were saying how, how um, surely out of love, uh, a, a parent who believes in Buddhism would, would you know, educate their child in it rather than you know, leaving them to find their own way or whatever. But that kind of relates to my surprise that why isn't Buddhism more evangelical? It doesn't seem to be very much... Like, I mean, is, is there rules against it or something? Because, you know, it's, it seems like it seems to very much sit there and kind of hope that people will find it rather than going out in the streets as, you know, Christians definitely do. But I don't think I've ever seen a Buddhist on the street handing leaflets out or anything like that. You know what I mean? Or, or, or I don't know. It's, it's why isn't it evangelical? Because it's a message worth spreading as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, anyway, sorry. <laughs> No, uh, don't be sorry at all. Thank you so much for that question, James, actually. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, and I would say that the Buddha created um, um, I wouldn't call it evangelism because there's not the idea in Buddhism of going and converting people, but rather there's it's embedded in the, the monastic precepts to actually uh, at least in early Buddhist precepts, uh, in early Buddhist practice for monastics, it's embedded actually to be uh, constantly in contact uh, with lay people. So making the teachings available. So making ourselves available. So for those who are interested then to have the possibility to have access to the Dhamma. So for example, when um, I just went actually um, uh, in Italy, for um i was there for a month and uh, for 10 days uh in in june i was um doing tudong practice so basically um just walking around sleeping wherever uh, going pinapata every day one meal a day etc so different villages in italy one day after the other um, and that was actually an, a really, it was really kind of like living uh, a page of the suttas, uh, where you see this, um, how incredible uh, the teach, like the Vinaya is actually how it's placed for monastics, because if we didn't have the precepts, for example, uh, of um, having our food offered every day, uh, not storing food, then we would easily become hermits. And then there would be like no sharing of the Dhamma would have probably died out um, right after the, the, the Buddha. But instead, uh, what we do, we have to constantly be in contact with lay people. Um, maybe we can skip a few days if we're really, you know, ascetic and uh, <laughs> and don't eat for for a couple of days. Uh, but there's so long that you can do that practice for. So that creates the conditions once again to get in touch with lay people uh, who are completely new uh, to to Buddhism. So that's what was happening in Italy. Uh, Italy, we would go there. Nobody was familiar with Buddhist monks. They had no idea who we were. Um, but just by the fact that we were present, um, then people would approach us and ask us who we were. And then we would they would ask us um, questions for Dhamma. And then they would ask us, where is the monastery? Oh, how can I learn more about this? Some people started meditating with us. Some people started 
um, yeah, just asking more questions, following us around, offering us, uh, you know, food here, shelter. And in that way, you just realize how basically there is a sharing of the Dhamma, but it comes from the interest of um, a person rather than an imposition. And so then if someone has an interest um, and comes to something with that mind state, then I think uh, there's more chances that actually they will be practicing, pursuing the path and, um, and doing this practice for their benefit and the benefit of others rather than kind of having different weird intentions about it. I don't know. I, I thought it was actually a very genius, simple way of sharing the Dhamma just with people who are interested and ready rather than doing a sort of kind of more more concerted effort. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question, but. Thank you. Now turn to Nikki for the next question. On mute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Really um, great to hear your, um, I love that. I was late, I was working late, but um, I liked what you said about, um, I don't know if it's depending where I've been listening to teachings, but there's not a lot, I've not heard a lot of teachings about sexual conduct in the way, I guess that is human, as in the way that we are related to today sexually. So that was good to hear a snippet of that. It was like, oh, I didn't know that. Then it made sense, like, no harm. If, you, if your sexual conduct does not harm, then yeah, of course. I know you, when you were talking about the poem about um, conditions on um, how we see people and what the world sees as valuable and beautiful. I was thinking about when I was 15, I shaved my hair. I remember shaving my hair. I mean, I've got shaved hair again, but um, midlife. Um, and then, um, and how I did that, I remember why I did that, because people would remark on my looks, had this lovely long hair, this like curly hair. And I was, you know, what the world would consider, you know, a pretty teenager. And nobody would take me seriously. I was an, also an animal activist, but it was, it was a bizarre experience. And I remember I shaved my hair off. Wow, what a difference. I think people were scared of me, actually. The moment I shaved my hair off, they were scared of me. So I was relating to that, to your story, when you were telling about that, that the, I wasn't taken seriously as a female. I was only young and I didn't quite understand that. But I didn't like it because I didn't care. It wasn't about my looks. It was about what I was thinking. And however, I am aware of my own conditioning. You know, I, I get it. I get, you know, I don't want to be treated that way, but I can also understand where that is. And when you talked about um, attachments and what we soothe in, like you talked about your food. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I've soothed in many things. I'm in recovery, so I've got a lot of things I've stopped self-soothing on, but one of the things I've struggled with is um, spending money on stuff. I mean, look at look at my wall <laughs> behind me. That's only a snippet of my life. Um, and I, I'm hoping, I guess my question to you would be with that, I mean, I've been meditating four years. I've been on this four years. I know it's not a long time in relation to stuff. He's eased somewhat. But I was listening to things, it was Ajahn Brahm this morning, he said about the wanting mind. And I really, I thought, yeah, I just keep wanting stuff. Yeah, well, I would say that yeah. sometimes we have to be um, very astute with ourselves and turn our weak points and our assets. So for example, if right now you're seeing that um, there is a lot of uh, sukha in spending things and purchasing things, right? then maybe we want to steer that towards the whole sun. So then if you really like to spend things, <laughs> purchase things, how about you purchase a bunch of meals for Venerable Chanda when she comes? <laughs> it's a great way of like, you know, doing something, but redirecting it. So then we do a sort of gradual practice and we, um, uh, we kind of trick our mind to like let go of... Um, say something unwholesome for us, but keeping that 
kind of nice momentum and directing it towards doing something for others, for example. And that can be something very wholesome, right? And then from there, I mean, um, there will be, instead of like doing too many crazy things, uh, like purchasing too many things that we don't need, then we start, we are better equipped because we have made enough merit, you know, by purchasing all those meals to venerable Chanda. <laughs> she will have a very full stomach. You'll have a lot of merit. Then you'll also have a lot of strength in actually um, being uh, more present and going, oh, well, actually, I don't need this poster or I don't need this thing, but I do need, I want, I, I need this other thing. Um, so you're a lay person, so you don't have to be a monastic and have zero, uh, but there is a difference between having zero and having a thousand, right? A thousand mm -hmm. things that maybe you don't need and they are very, um, maybe they might give you that kind of like quick fix mm -hmm. um, in that second and then you're like, okay, now I need a, a thousand more things. So that's also why we make merit, you know, we make all these acts um, of, um, of giving. Uh, that's why monastics are there, you know, it would be so much easier for Venerable Chanda to have her own kitchen and cook and do and store food and do her own thing like 24 <laughs> seven. But instead, she gives you the opportunity of like taking care of her food, her, um, her, all her requisites, her shelter, her, her, um, all the, the different requisites that we need as monastics, right? We do that as a practice for contentment for ourselves, but also to become fields of merit uh, for lay people. Because in order to practice generosity, there always has to be someone to uh, receive that generosity. Otherwise, you know, if I want to give this cup to someone, well, right now I can't give it to anyone. <laughs> so there is no one to give it to. And then get more in tune with uh, your emotional um, experience of giving and see how much sukha there is in, uh, in letting go and giving, you know, uh, when I started uh, uh, my practice, actually, uh, the way that I um, overcame my dukkha of not eating dinner was actually by we were doing all these vegan dinners at the center in um, in Rockway Beach and I remember <laughs> I was not <laughs> eating um, but you know there at the very beginning there were some other people volunteers making the Jamaican dinner the Chinese dinner and everybody was eating except for me and uh, the other people on the eight precepts and my mind was full of dukkha and desire wanting that damn food and like having all unwholesome like thoughts towards everybody that was eating and then when was my turn to cook and I made this uh, Italian vegan dinner then my inner grandma Italian grandma came out and I was like oh yes would you like this would you like that so I was so happy for people to that they were enjoying the food that I had made so the greed was replaced uh, by mudita and I remember going, oh, now Mudita feels so much better in my mind. That's something that I want to cultivate. And so from then onwards, then I knew exactly what I had to do. It didn't matter whether or not I was making the food. I could just go Mudita. I would focus on like, oh, this person is having a pleasant time eating this food. Oh, great. Good for them. Oh, yeah. Oh, lovely. Oh, I'm happy. They're happy. Wonderful. So this is why I'm saying you have to kind of find, I don't have the right specific answer for your condition that's for you to find out but look at the conditions of your mind and see what works for you and if it doesn't work try something else try something else but it always has to be in relation to others not just to you like just try to find the sukha of um yeah helping others do you think i need to see the response to get the <laughs> or do could i do it and not see it landing would I still get that? Because I feel quite isolated. So if I was in community, I think it would, I would feel that of service feeling. Because mm -hmm. I felt far, oh, but um, being in somewhat isolated at the moment, I, do you see what I'm saying? I wouldn't see. Right. Would it, yeah. You can recollect your act uh, through meditation practice. Uh, that's uh, meditation practice there, Sila Nusati. You can do also Dana Nusati. So you can recollect yourself how great you are, by the way. <laughs> like, oh, I just sent a meal. I'm great. <laughs> we don't have to be like embarrassed about like the good qualities that we, the good acts that we do in Buddhism. Actually, we want to recollect them, not feel superior to others who are not doing it, but also not diminish them. So you can recollect that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Superb. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Of course. And Manori has some um, question or comment? Yes, um, I, uh, um, I had this question for some time and I thought you might be the best person to answer it because you have done a lot of research on theories. So my question for a long time was, there was so much of enlightened senior theories during the Buddha's time. But when it came to the first council, why didn't they have any uh, bhikkhunis there, the enlightened bhikkhunis there? I was wondering whether you have done any research on such things. <laughs> That's a very good question. Thank you, Manori. Um, I personally think that uh, you know, there's certain things actually that has, have been preserved well and some that haven't been preserved well. Uh, I think the first council is in the latter that is not being preserved well. <laughs> there's a lot of discrepancies. Um, so with uh, the whole, with the, the early Buddhist teachings and also a lot of scholars have, now we don't have time maybe to get into the nuts and bolts movie. We can actually do another um, class also with uh, with Venerable Chanda when she returns um, precisely on on this on the, on the first council and so forth. But yeah, so I would say that that is in the. I mean, Buddhism is a really inconvenient religion. Inconvenient religion. The fact that the Buddha created uh, both orders and also that there is not only gender equality in Buddhism. There is actually the. I mean, the Buddha goes further. <laughs> the Buddha says that essentially um, gender is something that we um, hook, hang on to, like that is completely absurd, no different than blue eyes, you know, blue eyes, brown eyes, like we don't get as obsessed with uh, those types of features or blonde eye, blonde hair and um, brown hair, right? It's just a, a physical feature. So also when we look at the animal world, for example, foxes, we have foxes here, nobody knows if like the fox is female or male, like we just talk about foxes, right? We're like, oh, okay, there's a fox, that's it. Um, so obviously that is, the Dhamma, the Dhamma is the fox. <laughs> but when, um, for different historical reasons, we start saying that there is something very specific to that, con that distinguishes the female fox from the male fox and that the female fox is inferior to the male fox, then to have a religion, um, a spiritual system, that many people are practicing, that many people are following, that says that that is completely like an abstruse um, <laughs> concept. Uh, well, definitely very inconvenient. I'm actually quite surprised that we even have everything that we have preserved in Buddhism. I think that's actually a manifestation of the fact that there were, um, that this path um, creates enlightened beings who have preserved um, these teachings. Because otherwise, I mean, literally, find one single other religion where there is something equivalent to the Terigata, find any type of system of thought, like philosophy anywhere. Actually, if anything, Aristot Aristotle, for example, was using um, as a theory to uh, justify slavery. He was using that, he was using basically the example that women were um, naturally inferior to men as a matter of fact to justify how, <laughs> you know, from there, there was like a natural order of inferiority, which could justify something like slavery. So there has been like thousands of years of patriarchy, but also patriarchy is not, you know, a status, like a, a, it's not something that has always been there. It's a conditioned phenomenon. So it has, it's also impermanent. In fact, we see that right now it's <laughs> the verge of collapsing. Um, it's, we're still living in a patriarchal society, but it's very different than how it was a thousand years ago. Um, and so, yeah, so I would say let's not take everything um, as if it was exactly an historical account because it isn't. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be in contradiction with many other other parts. But we can speak a little bit more in detail. Maybe we can speak actually about gender in general in the next um that will be the third, <laughs> the third episode of the Tirigata. Here, now we have a topic. 
<laughs> Great. So I hope that kind of um, addressed your question. But once again, we can speak about it a little bit more next time. All right. Well, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> sounds wonderful to have this topic to the next conversation. And thank you so much, Isoma, for being here with us again today for what I thought was a very directed and powerful talk. Thank you. And also, I would like also just very quickly to mention a few things that this is the second talk in a series of three. So it now sounds like in two weeks time, the third series has a topic, the third uh, episode. <laughs> okay, so the first episode can be found on this Zoom uh, YouTube link, which I have just posted into the chat. If you would like to look it up for next time. Also, if you'd like to find out more about Empty Cloud Monastery and also the work of ISOMA, this can be seen by the Empty Cloud website, emptycloud.org. And it was mentioned during this question and answer session that there might be an opportunity to provide for the requisites of Venerable Chanda. Thank you for that mention. <laughs> and this can be done at the moment, the best way is via a monetary donation via annucamperproject.org forward slash donate. And from November or December onwards, there'll be an opportunity to offer Dana in person again, which we're really excited about. So thank you for being here and I look forward to seeing you again next week. And I so my in two weeks time. Looking forward to it. All right, may you be all well and happy and may all good things come to you.